Han hor ye bort bo ye bo guinser po. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ rarely tells us plainly about his identity through argumentation or reasoning, the way that we might expect him to. Rather, we see throughout the Gospels that he opts to show us who he is through imagery. Sometimes this imagery is acted out through his miracles, right? His healings, walking on the water, casting out demons. Other times, this imagery is painted through words, right? Through statements about himself. I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. I am the light of the world. Christ chooses to use imagery rather than plain language when describing who he is because a picture is worth a thousand words. And so, if Christ wanted to begin to describe the infinitude of his majesty, mere words simply wouldn't cut it. Often we might think of some of the images that we find in the Bible as a way of simplifying down difficult and abstract concepts to a child's level. And yet, it couldn't be further from the truth. The more that we understand the images that Christ chooses when describing himself, the more that we see that these images are chosen to unfold deeper and deeper insights, the more that we choose to explore them. But in order for us to understand this biblical imagery, we must choose to pay close attention to the context in which our Lord chooses to give these images. And there's no better example of the importance of understanding the context to understand Christ's words than what we see in today's Gospel reading. We hear in today's Gospel reading, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, and out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Quite a vivid image. Jesus seems to be offering a source from which the parched can be quenched. That is, a place where people can come who are in need and be satisfied. And Christ could have described this concept in a number of different ways, right? He could have said that he was wealth for the impoverished. He could have said that he was clothing for the cold. He could have said that he was shelter for the homeless. And yet, he didn't choose any of these images, did he? In this context, he chose to describe that his presence in our life was like a source of water that we could come to and drink and be satisfied. Why did Christ do this? Every word of his is intentional. Why in this context did he choose this image? In the context that we get right before we hear this, this proclamation by Christ is about the time and the season that this proclamation was made. We hear that it was on the last day of the feast, the great day, that Jesus stood up and proclaimed these words. We might ask ourselves, the last day of what feast? The great day of what feast? That seems to be important. And if we zoom our lens out a little bit, we'll see that at the beginning of John chapter 7, from which today's reading comes from, we hear that it's the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths. For those of us who may have Jewish friends in our life, this is a feast that is still celebrated by Jews to this day. It's called Sukkot. We might be familiar with some of our friends who put up um, some sort of a tent outside, and they actually sleep in this tent for about a week during the month of September. This seven-day Jewish festival, where they live outside in tents, is a commemoration of remembering the days that the Israelites were escaping from Egypt, when they went into the wilderness of Sinai, and they didn't have a permanent home. They were nomads going through the wilderness, and so where do they live? But in tents, in these dwellings that they would construct for themselves. And so, what we hear through Scripture is that the eighth day of this seventh-day festival, 
Yes, I had said that, right? The eighth day of a seventh-day festival, as already interesting, is called the Great Day. The Great Day. In the biblical language, when we hear about the eighth day, we think about something that's outside of time, right? Because our week has seven days. And so the eighth day is something beyond time. And so on the eighth day of this festival, the Great Day, Actually, two different feasts are celebrated on the same day in the Jewish tradition. The first is called Shemini Azteret. This is a ceremony, this is a festival, where they pray for the coming of the rains. Right? In September, they've gone just to the end of the drought of the summer, and they begin fervently praying for rain. Without rain, there's no life. Without rain, there's no crops. Without rain, there's no food. And so, of course, people in an agricultural society would always pray for rain. But specifically during this feast, their fervent prayer for rain would begin. The second feast that's commemorated on the great day of the feast is called Simchat Torah. Simchat Torah. And Simchat Torah is a day that commemorates the end and the beginning of something important. That is the end of the yearly reading through of the five books of, of the Torah, our first five books of the Bible, the Jewish law. And so every year on Simchat Torah, they would end their yearly reading through of the scriptures. And as a way of celebrating this ending of reading, they would take the scroll that they just finished and they would do a sort of parade with it all through the village. Right? And they would go and they would process this, this um, um, scroll back into the synagogue and pull out the new one. Pull out the scroll from the book of Genesis. And they would process with that and do their first reading for the beginning of the year. We see on this day two celebrations that really are one in the same. Shemini Azteret, the praying for rain, is a time, of course, of praying for the coming of physical rains, right? That almost magically come from heaven and appear to quench the thirst of the land. And in a similar way, that's kind of what God's word is, right? God's word comes to us in a way that we don't understand, in a way that we don't comprehend, from heaven, from the sky, and comes and it quenches us in a similar way on our spiritual journey. And so, on this Jewish feast, this double feast of the raining down of physical water and also the raining down of the law, the Torah, the scripture, the spiritual water, Christ boldly then gets up and says, If anyone should thirst, let him come to me and drink. What a bold statement. Essentially, Christ is saying, stop looking for the rain up in the sky. Yes, that's important. Also, stop looking for the rain that's in the Torah far away, a scripture of a God speaking down from heaven. That's important too. But stop looking for these things. Something greater is here. The true rain that will quench the thirst of your soul can be found right here. It's already come from heaven, and it's offered through me. And Christ goes on to say that these waters that he will give are his very spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. It's no wonder that the Jews of Jesus' day wanted to put him to death. If Christ wasn't who he said he was, what a blasphemous and delusional thing that he would say about himself. That he is the one who could give all of the, fulfill all of the needs that were within the people's hearts. That he was the very God who made them and could sustain them. What a bold claim. Christ, though, goes on. He doesn't simply say, come to me and drink. Not only does he command these thirsty people to come to drink, but he says that those who do out of their hearts shall flow rivers of living waters. The shocking claim that Christ is making about himself is that 
Not only can we come to him and be quenched of our deepest thirsts and longings through his Holy Spirit, but after we come and drink, we ourselves can become the very means by which others can receive this living water. If Christ is a body of water, a body of spirit imbued in living water that we can come to and drink, we are told in response to drinking that we can become the rivers which take this water from its source and disperse it throughout the world that others too may drink. What an incredible calling we have, brothers and sisters. I think, though, that at our best, we hopefully at least make the effort to come to drink from these waters on a regular basis. I think, though, often we may forget the second part of the deal. How often do we come to God? We come to the Lord because we're thirsty in some way, right? Lord, I need to be healed by you. Lord, I desperately need this blessing in my life. Lord, I feel the craving to have a personal relationship with you in my life, right? You and me, Jesus, I want to have a relationship with you. And on the surface, what a wonderful and beautiful thing. But the more that we understand today's reading, we realize that it's not enough. The more that we come to know who Christ is and what he came to do, the more that we can see that simply coming to Christ in this way is quite a self-centered way to approach him, quite an isolated way to enjoy God's blessings. In a sense, it's a way of enjoying the blessings of the selfless God in an incredibly selfish way. At the heart of Christ's words in today's gospel of this beautiful image of the living waters, we receive a calling to become the vessels through which living waters may flow to others. And I think that we're called to change our view, to change our paradigm on what our relationship with God means. Right? Rather than simply saying thank you to God for his blessings, anytime that we are touched by the grace of God, we have received the call by him and the privilege to become the conduits through which this grace may be shared by God to others. And I think this can come in any forms, right? If I have learned about the Bible or the church tradition or something else that has fed my soul in a deep way through the gift of a spiritual teacher in my life, I have also been given the opportunity to let this teaching flow through me by teaching others. If I receive material blessings, maybe through inheritance or through the gift of a skill set given to me by God or through a hard work ethic, I have received the honor of letting those material blessings flow through me to provide for those in dire straits. If I come from a loving family who valued me and loved me and cared for me, I have the privilege of seeking out those who were not so lucky, those who are lonely and hurt, those whose families were not there for them. And I have the privilege of allowing that love that I receive flow through me and to grace them with that gift of that love. What an incredible calling we have each received, brothers and sisters. What a privilege to be able to serve this pivotal role in the lives of others. It's incredible. We no longer need to pray for the reigns of God's love to miraculously come from heaven. Maybe one day we'll receive them. No, they're already here. We already have been the beneficiaries of receiving this love. The source of the waters of eternal life has already come. All we need to do is to approach and to drink. And in the abundance of his grace, we can become the very means by which he quenches the deep thirst of others. And so during this holy badarak, I pray that each of us may discern the ways in which God may be calling us through the blessings that he has given us 
to allow those blessings to th flow through us to others. May the grace of his waters well up in us and through us also in others into everlasting life. To the fountain of life, the sharer of grace, and to the Father and to the Son, be glory, dominion, and honor. Amen.